Well, that's the gospel you preach to yourself in those moments where you've had the 17th conversation with a child who's not listening. When you've realized something about your teenager that is devastating. When you just feel like what you're doing isn't working, God Almighty, holy, holy, the great I am. You don't load your children on your shoulders every morning because God carries them. You're not the change agent. You ready for this? You have no ability to change your child, zip, not a nun. It's not your job. You are a tool in God's hands, and that's why those truths are so important. It's uh, great to be with you this evening. It's sort of great to be anywhere on the ground. We had a very interesting entrance to our flight. They told us we were at gate 29, and then they said gate 16, then they sent us to gate 12, and then to gate 14. We finally were at gate 14, and we watched them load our luggage, not on our plane, but onto another plane. They told us the gate, they will unload it. They did. They unloaded it and put it in another plane. So I'm, I'm very glad to be here. And I don't know what you have in mind for this evening, yes, even those of you around the world. Some of you just want, give me three keys to get my daughter to eat her vegetables. Give me seven things I can do to help my teenager dress like he's from Earth. Please help me with this. And if you've come for that, you're probably going to be disappointed, but let me say this to you. What the Bible gives us is something tremendously better. Because what the Bible gives us is a radically different way of thinking about ourselves, thinking about our children, and thinking about the process of parenting. And when you understand what the Bible has to say, all of a sudden, you think differently, and you do different things. I think one of our problems is that we sort of understand the gospel past, the forgiveness we've received in Jesus, and the gospel future, that eternity we're going to spend with the Lord, but we don't understand the present benefits of the work of Christ, what God has given us right here, right now. I call it the nowism of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The gospel isn't just for your past. It isn't just for your future. It is for your right now. And the gospel is meant to be a set of lenses that you put on like the glasses I have on, and when you look at life, you look at it radically differently. I want to help you to do that in a foundational way with this significantly important thing called parenting. What could be more important in all of life than to be God's tool on sight for the forming of a human soul? How incredibly important is that. And what I want to do tonight is I want to lay down a foundation, a way of thinking about it that I think probably few people in the world have thought about parenting the way we're going to talk about it. I want to give you what I think is just a beautiful way of thinking about what God has called you to. It's a liberating way. It's a, it's a fear-freeing way of talking about this task of parenting. And then what I want to do is, in the sessions that follow, unpack that for you in some greater detail. Here we go. Well, it was the end for me of a very long parenting day. One of my sons had been particularly contentious. It's one of those days where he had an argument for everything, where he resisted everything he was told. And if he couldn't resist it, he did it as slowly as possible. I was beside myself. And what I didn't realize is there was this anger and impatience growing in me. You ever had any anger as a parent? Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. 
And so he's supposed to be long in bed. I'm heading upstairs to finally uh, have a little bit of re relaxation myself, and I hear him arguing with his brother in his room. Oh, boy. So I start down the hallway, feet heavy on the floorboards, saying, thank you, God, for this wonderful opportunity to be a tool in your hands. No, that's not what I was thinking. <laughs> I was thinking, wait till I get into that room. I'm going to let him have it. Clearly the character of Jesus. And I burst into his room and I ripped him. I left him, burning Hulk. Went back to my room. I sat on the edge of my bed, but something happened to me. I didn't feel victorious. I didn't feel like I had won. I felt defeated, uh, restless. Because think about that. Go back in the room with me. When, when you're up in the face of your child and you're telling them what for, whether they're this big or this big, what do you think is going on inside of them? Do you think they're saying, my, this is helpful. I'm so thankful this person is my parent. They clearly love me. I think I can see my heart. Where's Jesus? I want to follow him. I don't think that's what they're thinking at all. Though think with me, parents. Even as an adult, has, have you ever had a moment where somebody has got up in your face and said inflammatory things to you? maybe so close that you can feel their breath, have you ever been thankful? Never. You see, the Bible would tell me that there, what was missing in that moment could be summarized by one powerful, transformative word. And I'm going to say this to you right now. It, it may hurt your feelings. But if you don't get how this word changes parenting, you don't yet fully understand what God has called you to. You ready for the word? Mercy. Parenting is a mission of mercy. Parenting is a mission of mercy. Now, you got to pay attention here. I'm going to unpack this for you because I know there's tremendous misunderstanding about this word. But let me say this first. If all your children needed was a set of rules and a commensurate set of punishments, stay with me here, Jesus would have never had to come. If that's all your children needed was strong rules, strong judgment, strong enforcement, the cross would not have been necessary. Now, do your children need rules? Yes, they need rules. God's law exposes wrong, does a beautiful job of exposing sin. God's law is a wonderful guide for life. Your children need rules, they need authority, but here I'm about to say, rules have no ability whatsoever to rescue and transform the heart of your child, none. Did you hear what I said? Rules have no ability whatsoever to rescue and transform the heart of your children, none. God's law is holy and perfect, but it was not enough. Do you hear what I said? This is what we believe. This is in the songs that you sing. Why do we abandon it when we parent? Why do we reduce parenting down to just a set of rules and a set of enforcements?
when clearly the whole sweep of Scripture is that as perfect and holy and good as the gift of the law is, you understand I'm not against rules. I'm not against authority. The whole sweep of Scripture is it was not enough. Because there's something inside of every child who has taken the first breath that won't be broken by rules. There's something inside of your child that won't be transformed by rules. There's something deeper and more profound hanging inside of this child. The child needs mercy. I want you, if you have a Bible with you or near you or your iPhone or iPad or whatever weird set off-brand you're carrying. (laughs) To turn with me to Hebrews 4, verse 14. Now here's what we're going to do. We're going to take the Heavenly Father the way he parents us and works change in us as our model for what he calls us to do with our children. You hear what I said? We're going to take the heavenly father as our model for how to parent. The wise, perfect, heavenly father. And you will at first say, how is this practical? But as we get through this weekend, you'll see how radically practical this is, how transformative it is for you and for your children. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. This is verse 14. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who is in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Now here's what it says. Our Heavenly Father is sympathetic and understanding because he's walked in our shoes. He knows what it's like to live in this broken world with all of its temptations. He understands weakness. That word that says he's able to sympathize with our weaknesses is is almost untranslatable. It's It's a word for every kind of human weakness. It could be translated the human condition. He gets it. He gets what it's like. And so he looks on us, parents get this, with compassion. The thing that ought to fill your heart every day toward your children is compassion. Here's what mercy is. Mercy is compassion that motivates a desire to help. Mercy is compassion with action. Now here's what I think we do. We forget that what our children are dealing with, the stuff that holds them, the stuff that motivates them, the stuff that drives them, they didn't choose to have part of their life. The Bible names it. It's sin. Sin causes you to be self-focused. Sin causes you to hate rules. Sin causes you to push against authority. 
Sin causes you to think you're wiser than you actually are. Sin causes you to want your own rules and have your own way. Who does that do it to? All of us. And so rather than being mad at your children because you're seeing their struggle, you look on them compassion because you understand what they're trapped in, what they're held in. When is mercy needed? When a person is in danger or need that they can't get themselves out of. Let me say that again. When is mercy needed? When a person is held in danger and need that they can't get themselves out of. Listen, here's what the Bible says. This should break our hearts. The most dangerous thing in the lives of your children is inside of them, not outside of them. Your child, children, are a mortal danger to themselves. And because of that, they're massively needy. Do they know it? No. They don't think they're needy. They think they're okay. They think they know more than you. They think the way is better than you. Now, here's what I think we do. Oh, I, 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 I got to talk about this, and I... I know this stuff is hard to talk about, but I think we turn God-given moments of mercy into moments of anger. We tend, we get, we turn God-given moments of mercy into moments of anger. Now, let me explain to you why. Because we tend to personalize what is not personal. We make it about us. How dare you do this to me? I would have never thought of saying that to my parent. Why, in my day... Now, now think about it. That night, when my son is arguing with his brother in his room, do you actually think he got up that morning and said, at 9.35, I'm going to drive my dad crazy. Yeah, that's what I'll do. That's not what happened. It's not against me in that way. He's not trying to wreck my day. Your children are not, are not working to spoil your vacation. They're not working to make dinner chaos. It's not personal. And if you personalize it, you never get to the point where you actually help a child because you say adversarial things and you settle for quick situational solutions, you throw a punishment, you walk away, and that child is utterly in the same danger and they're utterly unchanged. You can have a parent encounter and that child is not moved at all away from the danger that has him gripped in, in its grip. What we know is our Father is sympathetic and understanding because He knows what we're dealing with. And so we get from Him help in our time of need, help that's truly helpful. It's mercy. Now, I know what happens when I use this word. When I use this word, there are dads and moms in the room that say, he's just talking about permissive parenting. Instead of discipline, I'm just going to give mercy, and my kid's just going to go wild. How's that going to work? Let me just clear this up for you. Mercy never calls wrong right. Mercy never calls wrong right. If wrong were right, there would be no need for mercy. Mercy's never wishy-washy. Mercy never compromises God's holy standards. Mercy never calls wrong right. Mercy never says yes all the time. Mercy is not indulgent, permissive neglectful. That's not mercy. Mercy 
A call to parental mercy is not a call to forsake authority in any way. Mercy is not calling wrong right. Mercy is a way of approaching what is wrong that has a whole different agenda to it. Now, I love, it was very, very moving to me. I don't know uh, how many of you remember the exact moment, but that moment when the attack at 9-11 and those towers were on fire, I sat and watched the second plane hit a tower on my television in Philadelphia. And we saw dear firefighters and dear policemen running into the buildings and up the steps. When other human beings were running down the steps and out of the buildings. Why do they do that? Because there's compassion in the hearts of those men. And they knew in those upper floors there were people in danger and need who could not help themselves. And so they were willing not only to have their day messed up or their life messed up, but yes, even willing to die. Mercy runs toward difficulty, not away from it. Mercy is not shocked that difficulty happens. Mercy is ready for difficulty to happen. Parents, I want to give you a concept. You are God's first responders. As parents, you are God's first responders. You are there to run toward those moments. No matter what your schedule is, no matter what you're doing. You know, if you know the story of 9-11, that many firemen showed up who, who weren't even on their shift, right? It wasn't a matter of their schedule. There was, there was need, and they went. That's parenting. Let me give you the model here. Here's how it works. I'm going to repeat this a couple times to make sure that you get it. If your eyes ever see and your ears ever hear the sin, weakness, and failure of your children, it's never an accident. It's never a hassle. It's never an interruption. It's always grace. God loves that child. He's put him in a family of faith, and he will reveal the need of that child to you so you can be a tool of his transforming mercy. Let me say that again. If your eyes ever see and your ears ever hear the sin, weakness, and failure of your children, it's never an accident. It's never an interruption. It's never a hassle. It's always grace. God loves that child. He's put him in a family of faith, and he will reveal the need of that child to you so you can be a tool of his rescue and transformation. Parents, there's a way in which it makes no sense to get mad because your children need parenting. Because every time you're called into action, you're called in action because God loves your child. He loves your boy. He loves your girl. And he has revealed the need, the danger of that child so you can be part 
of his rescue and his transformation. You see, you are his ambassador. What is the only thing an ambassador ever does? Can you tell me? You can say it in a word. You're so quiet. Represent. Listen, you're the look on God's face. You're the tone of his voice. You're the touch of his hand. God makes his invisible mercy visible by sending parents of mercy to give mercy to children who need mercy. That's the the agenda. That's the plan. Every time you have to deal with rebellion. Every time you have to deal with back-talking. Every time you have to deal with disobedience. Every time you have to deal with resistance. Every time it's grace, it's mercy, it's an opportunity, it's a joyful, good thing because, oh, you get yet another opportunity before this child is out of the home and on his own to be part of this work of rescue that God would do. It's It's a good thing, it's a good thing, it's a good thing, it's a good thing. No, I don't like that. I'll just be honest. I want to get in the car with four children and not have war making just getting in the car. I want to go on vacation and because I parented my kids all year, I want to go on vacation and have self-parenting children. If God would throw in a fully sanctified wife, that would be cool. I don't want a half a mile down the road to my children already be fighting in the back of their seats. My dear dad was taking us on a family road trip. If you want to understand depravity, take a family road trip. You'll not only stand, understand your children's depravity, you'll understand yours. And my brother Mark and I were fighting in the back seat, and so he came up with this, this is classic dad stuff to do. He said, pretend that there's a concrete block wall between you. So we fought for the first 200 miles about exactly where the wall was. And then I told my brother Mark that I'd taken a block out of the wall and I could reach through and touch him. About 600 miles, my dad was a psycho killer. (laughs) Listen, this stuff is hard for us. I don't want to have that same fight 17 times with you. I don't want to put you to bed 26 times. My brother Ted, that's his record. My mom put him to bed 26 times. He didn't understand how she knew. There was a floorboard that was loose, and she heard the creak every time but he kept trying. I want to have a peaceful dinner. I don't want to get that horrible call from your school teacher that said you put a girl's hair in your class in the paper cutter. I don't want to deal with that. Because I want my life to be comfortable. I want it to be predictable. I want it to be easy. I I want it to work well. I want, I want, I want. Listen. That means I don't want to be part of God's agenda. I want my life the way I want my life. Listen, that's the struggle of every parent. That's my struggle. I wish I could say that in all those years of parenting, I never got angry, but I can't. I wish I could say I never said things that I regret saying, but I can't. I wish I could say I never stomped down the hallway, but I can't. And so, hear this, if we're ever going to give mercy, we need mercy. Parents, hear this. You don't so much need to be rescued from your children. You and I need to be rescued from ourselves. So we would actually 
view those moments as opportunities. We'd actually view them with joy. We'd actually move toward the child with the right attitude and the right words, with a heart full of compassion. Think about it. Think how sad it is for a four-year-old to be so delusional that he actually thinks he can win a battle with a person four times his size. You laugh, but that's sad. If that doesn't change, he will destroy his life as an adult. How sad is it for a sibling to find joy in saying cruel things to a sibling? Cruel things. That's horrible. It's sad. You wouldn't want that person as your neighbor. You wouldn't want that person as your friend. You wouldn't want that person as your boss or your spouse. It's sad. How sad is it for a child to think they have wisdom they don't have, to think they know more about diet and more about health and more about relationships than wise parents know? It's sad. How can you not look at that and say, with a heart of compassion and say, this is sad, I want to help. I don't want to just control this child. Listen, if all you do is work to control your child, when the time they leave their home, yay, they have nothing. You want to be part of a work to transform your child so progressively your child becomes a different human being. Mercy. You say, Paul, I... I get the word, but I'm not sure what. Mercy means. Well, let me give you some things it means. I'm just gonna list these for you. We're gonna unpack these throughout this weekend and make this very practical. First thing it means is mercy always means helping your children to see the heart behind their behavior. I'm going to unpack this, but you're never just dealing with behavior. You're always dealing with the heart of the child. In fact, we're going to unpack this in our next session. Don't just give in to managing behavior. You want the child to see the heart behind the behavior because you want your children to growingly say, there's something wrong inside of me that needs to change. Mercy means being patiently committed to process. It's the very last thing we're going to talk about in the last session. It doesn't take long reading scripture to understand that change is seldom an event. Change is most often a process. Now I know it's tempting as a parent to want to go into the room and just win. You want to have one kind of conversation with your child and they say, you're right, I'm a sinner, I'm full of idolatrous thoughts, I disrespect authority, I now confess all of those sins and commit my life to holiness from this point on. (laughs) But it's a process. Mercy means pointing your kids every day to Jesus. This is not weird, upper story, creepy, theological stuff. Your children need to know where help can be found. Because if you're telling them they need help, you better refer to them to somebody other than yourself. Somebody bigger than yourself. Somebody more powerful than yourself. Somebody who can do for your children what you are unable to do. Mercy means humbly accepting your limits. Listen, if raising your volume could change your child, God would have hooked a megaphone to your mouth. If big, huge threat could do it, I think that we, we fall into doing things because we're trying to f- exercise enough power to finally get this child to change. Hear this. You have none of that power. None. But God does. And admitting what you cannot do 
is key then to being part of what God can do. Let me say that again. Admitting as a parent what you are unable to do is the introduction to being part of what God can do. This goes along with that. Mercy is constantly reminding yourself of God's presence and his power. It's never just you. You're never alone with your child. You're never ever in any situation or location alone with your child. Never, ever, ever. It's never just you and your child. Never, ever. In the car, on the back porch, in the bedroom, wherever you are, because God is present in all those places and he promises you his power. That's who we are. That's what we've been given. Mercy means willingly confessing your faults. It's not about presenting yourself as stronger and wiser and more righteous than you actually are. Mercy is letting your children know that you need mercy just as much as they do. And that endears your children to you. Because no one gives mercy better than a person who's convinced he needs it himself. No one gives mercy better than a person who is convinced he needs it himself. Mercy means rooting all you require in God's word. You're always referring your child to a higher authority. It's not a power struggle between you and your, your child. You're always referencing what God has to say and that you're just an ambassador. Mercy is being careful not to treat opportunities like hassles. Mercy is thankful for those opportunities because in every opportunity you've been given the opportunity because God loves your child. Mercy is being slow to anger and quick to forgive. You say, what do I do if I'm angry? Well, take some time. It can, you can pray this prayer in 15 seconds, God help me, I'm angry right now, I don't, want to re I don't want to respond in anger, won't you please help me? Sometimes you're so angry that you shouldn't deal with something because what you're gonna do is gonna do more damage than good. You say, well Paul, I don't want the kid to get away with it. Listen to me, God loves your child, he's living in your home, trust me, you'll get another opportunity. God is good. Quick to forgive. You don't hold a grudge against your children. You don't treat them in less than unloving ways because they've made your day hard. And then mercy means I pray before, during, and after. I want to unpack this for you in the next three sessions what it looks like to be part of God's transformative mercy, his rescuing mercy. Now I wanna say and confess before you that none of this is natural for me. I can be incredibly impatient, I can be incredibly self-righteous, I can look back on my history and I was a way more noble child than I probably actually was. I can throw that into the face of my children. I can quickly say things that are sharp and hurtful. There are times when I'm just, 
I would just scream inside, I don't want to deal with this now, I don't want to deal with this now, why are you doing this to me? There are those moments where you actually can't believe what you're dealing with. I've shared this uh, many times. We're on this, another one of these road trips, and my 12-year-old son had polyps in his nose, and he would wheeze when he breathed. <laughs> it was really pretty distracting. His sister is sitting next to him somewhere on the trip. She says, Dad, Ethan is bothering me. I said, what is, she do- what is he doing? And she immediately said, breathing. <laughs> Not willing to resist the opportunity, I said, and what do you want me to do? And without hesitation, she said, tell him to stop. (laughs) Now, you just want to stop the car at that moment and scream, are you crazy? Are you actually saying, kill my brother? His nose is irritating. And so... If you would, if you would for a moment with me, watch the video of your last six weeks of parenting. Would you do that right now? Just turn on the video of your last six weeks. Everything you said, everything you did, all your reactions and interaction with your child. How much do you need mercy? Mercy. You satisfied with everything you said? You satisfied with everything you did? Hear what I'm about to say. Your father looks on you as a parent. Are you listening to me? With all of your weakness and failure, and he's not angry at you. He's not disgusted with you. He's not ready to quit. But he comes to you and says, Dad, I know you're angry. Mom, I know sometimes you feel so hopeless. Dad, you've you've destroyed your relationship with your teenage boy. Mom, there are times where you just get a little bit crazy. but I'm not going to turn my back on you. I offer you my sympathy and my understanding, my compassion, and my mercy. Listen, the thing that I'm saying we need to give to our children is the only thing that gives us hope. Because today, Today, I didn't live up to God's standard. In some kind of thought, some kind of word, some kind of action, I fell short of God's standard, and so did you. Listen, this should not be weird to us because every day you are wake up to new mercies. Because your only hope between the already of your conversion and the not yet of your home going is God's mercy, that your Father is merciful and He keeps mo- moving towards you and He keeps working uh, with you and He will not get mad and He will not walk away and He will not condemn until finally you're ready for your final home. All I'm saying to you this evening is won't you give to your children what your father gives to you every single day of your life? Because if you will, that will change your children. It's powerful. They may not become everything you want them to be, but they'll be marked by that mercy. The Bible says something that's counterintuitive to to us. We think if we're louder and stronger and scarier 
Change will happen. The Bible confronts us with this. It's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance. The goodness of God. Not the condemnation, not the anger, the goodness of God. That's your model. And you ought to be sitting there this evening, wherever you are in the world, and you ought to be thinking, I want to be part of that. Paul, what does it look like to be part of that? Let's pray. Lord, there's probably a lot of questions and maybe some doubt and confusion in those who are listening in terms of what this looks like. It's it's not the way we normally think about parenting. And it is exactly the way you as a father work in our lives. You bless us You transform us with compassion that is driven to action, rescuing us from danger and meeting our needs. You go up the burning building, willing to suffer and die so we would have everything we need, so we would be changed, grow, mature, Become your adult children, ready to live as you've designed for us to live. That's the way you work. May we understand what it means to be part of your agenda of mercy. May we understand what it means to be tools in your redemptive, transforming, powerful hands. May at the end of this weekend... Friday, around noon, when we, when we leave the room, may we say, wow, God has been with us, and he's done a good thing. We have a whole new way of thinking about what we've called to. We have a whole new excitement about the task you've called us to. We have a, no, a whole new sense of how real, lasting change can take place. Thank you. Thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.